he didn't attend any journalism school, but he has carved out a stellar career as a writer, historian, professor, and now a dean. He was born and raised in Queens and graduated from Howard University, where he spent seven years working intermittently to raise enough money for his tuition. And he's a graduate of Rutgers University, where he received his doctorate in American history. He is the recipient of fellowships from the Fulbright and Ford Foundations. He was an associate professor of history and director of the Africana Studies Institute at the University of Connecticut, where he specialized in post-Civil War African-American history, 20th century American politics, and the history of the Cold War. He credits his knowledge of history with helping provide his journalism with the important attribute of context. Much of his current writing is what he calls opinion journalism, a craft or an art that he has been practicing at The New Yorker since 2012. He became a staff writer in 2015 and frequently writes about race, history, and culture. He still writes insightful essays for The New Yorker. That would be enough success for most writers, The New Yorker. But meanwhile, he joined the journalism school faculty in 2016 as the Ira A. Lipton Professor of Journalism. And he has published several books and a collection of essays and contributed to or edited several anthologies. And he has written for publications like the Washington Post and the New Republic. One of his books, The Substance of Hope, is about Barack Obama. Another is titled To the Break of Dawn, a freestyle on the hip hop aesthetic. His collections is call, called The Devil and Dave Chappelle and other, is, and other essays. You could say that he has a wide range. And now we're going to hear from the man himself about his plans for the J School and other matters as he answers questions from Alan Dodds Frank, a past president of the Silurians and yet another graduate of the Columbia Journalism School. Let's start with a really easy question. What's the hardest thing about being the dean of the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism? Uh, so first off, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be uh, in the presence of you know, so many people who have contributed uh, to this profession and this field that we care so much about. Uh, I'm you know, especially happy to be uh, surrounded by so many uh, alumni of the journalism school and uh, former instructors or professors there. And so uh, you know, thank you all for coming out for this. And uh, to answer your question, the hardest thing about being dean, uh, I mean, that's hard to quantify because there are lots of competing things. And when I first came in, um, it was like someone backed up a dump truck <laughs> and they were like full of paper. And it was like right here on his desk, like <laughs> all of these things. Uh, and so kind of figuring out, you know, what to prioritize, you know, what was most important, you know, what to, you had to respond to immediately and what you could put off until, you know, next week or never. Um, and so I, I learned the strategic importance of, did you email me that? I didn't see it. Um, and so, uh, but that was, that was kind of a quick adjustment. And the fortunate part for me uh, is that I have really good people around me. And so that's been helpful in, in the transition from being a faculty member. I was on faculty for six years uh, before I became dean. Uh, and so uh, I would say that's it. Okay. So. You're at least the third in line of the deans of Columbia <laughs> School of Journalism yeah. who also happen to write for this small magazine called The New Yorker. Yeah. Obscure How outlet. do you do that? <laughs> so, I told, interestingly enough, we not only, you know, myself, Steve Cole before me, Nick Lemon before him, uh, we not only were all staff writers at The New Yorker, we all had the same editor, um, which is Virginia Cannon. And so, I, when, when I got the position, I called Virginia and said, if you were inclined to set up a really shady consulting business, <laughs> saying, I can make you a journalism school dean, you could probably get away with it. <laughs> because we'd all uh, you know, had that common experience. But 
Um, there has been this relationship, you know, I think a mutually beneficial relationship between the New Yorker and uh, Columbia Journalism School. In fact, when I was interviewing for the job at Columbia, I was looking up information about the journalism school. Uh, there was, and I don't even think this was nothing official. I think it was like a blog somewhere that said uh, the journalism school has long enjoyed a relationship with the New Yorker and, and so on. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, and you know, it's been it just as as well the kind of vital relationship with the Times and lots of other outlets as well. So I think I, I'm, I don't know who my successor will be. But I can I feel fairly comfortable in predicting that it will not be someone who's a staff writer at the New Yorker. Okay. You're now in charge of a vast tribe spread across the globe. What's been surprising to you about the reach of Columbia Journalism School? Oh, so that wasn't new. Like that wasn't when I, when I became dean. That was apparent to me. Um, Within you know my first months as a faculty member, and I mean, this is going to sound like I'm sucking up here, but it's just the truth. Uh, the alumni network is astounding, and its influence is amazing. That we have people all over the world, uh, I think 15 or 16,000 strong, uh, placed in all kinds of outlets, in, in you know nonprofit, uh, traditional establishment, um, you know outlets. Uh, independent outlets, you know, foreign, domestic, uh, everywhere. And so it's this amazing resource uh, to be able to tap into for things that we need to do. The other thing that, that caught me off guard, though, this did catch me off guard, was when I was thinking about this position, I was thinking about the constituencies that would be invested in this, like people who would really care who the, the dean of the journalism school at Columbia is. I was wildly wrong about that. <laughs> I said, oh, it'll be journalists, it'll be alumni, um, you know, maybe a handful of people in higher education, uh, and of course the students. No. <laughs> like, everyone cares about this in a, in a way that was like really shocking to me. Uh, I have twin sons, they're three years old, and, well, thank you. I'll show you, I'll show everyone their picture. Um, and, uh, we were walk. I was walking them to school, and they, three is like a great age, you know. And so, I was walking them to school not long after the announcement was made. The person drove past, stopped, backed up, and said, "Hey, are you the new dean of Columbia Journalism School?" And I said, "What?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I am." And so uh, he pulled off. And he was like, "Congratulations, good luck," and then he drove off. Uh, and then uh, my son, Hollis, uh, looked at me and said, Daddy, is that your friend? And I was like, eh, I guess, maybe, <laughs> you know, I hope so. <laughs> um, and so I, I really underestimated just the surface area of this position. Okay, so, so yeah. what that really means is, at the risk of denigrating the position of Dean of Columbia School of Journalism, mm -hmm. You're really the pope of journalism now. I will make no. And no, such no. Seriously, I will say that there was the no pronouncements white smoke. from the, the there was the, no white smoke at my announcement. Oh so. well, you're not dead yet. <laughs> right. I mean, stop that white smoke stuff. So, the the defining characteristic when I was at Columbia in the class of 1970, along with two other clowns in this room, Jeff Tannenbaum and Michael Serrell, what I came away from is after, you know, when I started being a reporter, the, the, the differential between Columbia Journalism School and every place else, whether you went to journalism school or not, was that at least at that time, there was a stress on the ethics of journalism. Um, so I'm wondering how important that is to you now and how much you see that as a missing element of the rest of journalism. So, um Ethics is still at the core of what we do, uh, and you, you will likely recall, you know, that statement uh, that is etched on the wall um, in the lobby of Pulitzer Hall, uh, where you know we talk about Joseph Pulitzer wanting us to educate, uh, you know, ethical journalists, the, the next generation of journalists, and so uh, we take that very seriously. And one of the things that we're doing. Uh, for all the, actually I can do it here, for, for uh, all the alumni in the room, uh, 
I would ask, how well do you remember your reporting class at Columbia? Just like, this, so this has been a kind of common theme. The earliest class that I, a representative that I talked to, I talked to someone from the class of 1957. Um, and then I've talked to people from obviously last year's class, you know, the year before that. So the entire spectrum. And what amazes me is that people talk about their reporting class in, in consistent ways over that wide span of experiences that it really has this transformative effect on people in terms of learning to think like a reporter, learning to the, the actions and how a reporter approaches a story or sees the world and, and those kinds of things. Uh, and so that's you know, kind of at the core of what we do. And there's a reason that that course is, is paired with our ethics course that you were learning those things as you were learning the tools of the trade of reporting, you were also learning the ethical, moral considerations of what this craft is. Uh, and so for my incoming class, the first class that I addressed, I said, we have power, we have access to this incredibly powerful machinery. And everything we do has repercussions. If we get the weather report wrong, that has rep repercussions. Uh, and people, even if they're, they're these indicators of distrust in the media and so on, for the people who do trust us in the midst of the pandemic, where the website of the New York Times uh, might have been someone's lifeline in determining what their behavior would be, that, that is an incredible amount of power. And of the few things that I actually know, of the few things I'm actually certain of in life, is that access to that much power requires a profound degree of humility. Uh, and in regard to that, a profound degree of concern about what can go wrong when you misuse that power. Wow, that's a great pivot. The, one of the differences, I think, between being a journalism student 50 years ago and now is that none of us ever heard of the word branding. Yeah. Or for that matter, multimedia, not to mention the internet, et cetera, et cetera. How do you instruct these kids to separate themselves from the story when there's so much pressure to make the story about themselves? You know, so before brands, we had this very uh, antiquated concept called a reputation. <laughs> and so, um, and so, uh, and I would say I'm nostalgic for the era of good reputations as opposed to great branding. Um, we, it, this, we had our, our faculty retreat yesterday, and this came up as part of the conversation. Um, it was an ancillary part of a conversation, bigger conversation about social media and reporting. Um, and I'll just say this in order to get back to the point that you're making, which is that uh, you know, I recently left Twitter and you know, after Elon Musk uh, readmitted Donald Trump uh, to Twitter, I quit. And then I wrote a piece in the New Yorker explaining why. Uh, I said that the actions that were taken on this platform uh, directly contributed to the loss of life on January 6th. Uh, I was additionally motivated to take that stand by the fact that one of our alumna, uh, a young woman by the name of Anika Navroli, uh, was in fact the whistleblower at Twitter who alerted the January 6th committee to what was happening internally and that the extent to which people knew beforehand that someone was likely going to get killed on that day. There are actually memos saying like someone's going to die tomorrow uh, and there was nothing done to intervene. And so I quit, I left, and I got deluged with this question that really became more disturbing each time someone raised it. It was, oh, are you worried about loss of vis visibility? No, I, I'm not worried about that at all. <laughs> if nobody ever comes up to me on the, the one train and says, I read your tweet, and I'm like, <laughs> that never happens again, I'll be happy, you know? Uh, uh, are you worried about missing out on news? And like, oh, believe it or not, there are other ways actually to access news, I'm not that worried about that. But the really disturbing question was, how are you going to report? And that was what made me say, not only in terms of personal branding, 
um, which unfortunately is an asset in the job market now. Uh, for my young graduates, if they're going out into the world uh, and they have 50,000 followers on some platform, they look better than the person that's not on that platform at all uh, from the eyes of, a, of an employer. But from my standpoint, I've always been concerned, and certainly in recent months, been increasingly concerned that we made a trade-off and we never looked at the fine print on the other side of it. Because now, uh, in the midst of so much unethical behavior happening on social media platforms, journalists are pretty much stuck on there. The sources are reaching you through your direct messages, uh, or uh, you know, if you were tweeting a thread that goes viral, there are book publishers that will reach out to you. Do you want to write a book about this? There are editors that will reach out to you. Hey, do you want to turn that, that uh, tweet storm into an article or into an essay? Uh, and it has an actual financial um, payoff to being that visible on a site that has a very questionable relationship to journalism as it stands. OK, so I could go either way on this one. I could just say Murdoch. Or, um, but I think we'll save that for a minute. <laughs> it seems to me that Gresham's law is the cheap currency drives the deer out of circulation. You put your gold bars under the mattress. Mm -hmm. That there's a first corollary, which is Gresham's law of the media. Mm -hmm. And that what initially triggered it was 24-hour cable TV. Sure. And now we're like a quantum leap beyond that, which is exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So back to your position as Pope, what are you going to do to fix that? Um, what could you say more specifically to fix what? How, how do you get journalists out of this rut where their mid-level managers are saying, I expect three tweets before you file this oh, story? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I think that's a bigger problem. Um, what we're trying to do, what I've, what I've, you know, kind of doubled and tripled down on in my time, just in the past five months that I've been dean, uh, and that I intend to, I don't think will change in the course of, you know, my term, which is five years, is that we're in the business of producing uh, sharp, ethical, well-trained journalists. There's a lot that happens in the market. There's a lot that happens in the structure uh, of how journalism is being consumed. Uh, you know, people reporting on TikTok now, even for all of the kind of complications um, that that platform has that are, quite frankly, outside of our hands. Uh, but what we want to do is make sure that we are um, providing the best trained journalists that are operating in whatever medium uh, they're operating in. Uh, and, you know, that said, one of the big things that we want to do is to make sure that the burgeoning nonprofit news ecosystem, which is actually a growth area, uh, is a place that we see as potentially useful uh, for our graduates, you know, in terms of being placed in those, um, in those positions. And so, if you're in that place, you're le probably less likely to feel those pressures than you are if you're in some, um, really close to the bone uh, outlet where they think that you know tweeting may increase circulation which may uh, you know boost ad revenue just enough to turn this from from red to black for that month um, and so that's where we are with it what worries you most about the students as they arrive I mean what's their biggest deficit in terms of being on the path to being really professional, great editors and reporters. I'm glad you. I'm glad you brought that up. What worries me most is what worries them most, and what worries them most is money, cost, um, and so the cost of education. Our tuition is roughly seventy-five thousand, depending on what program you are uh, for the year. Um, and then with cost of living in New York City and so on, it gets to about $120,000. Um, looking at where salaries, the stagnation of salaries, and looking at the cratering of you know, so many positions uh, in local news, 
it becomes unfeasible for a lot of people to stay in journalism if they walk out with forty or fifty thousand dollars in debt. And so, if we're talking about um, the bets that I'm making, you know, the the wagers that I'm making uh, as a dean, uh, it's go big or go home. We have to find ways that we offset the cost of of journalism of a journalism education. Almost all of the journalism schools, and you know, we are the second oldest uh, in the country after the University of Missouri, um, which coincidentally was was also founded at the behest of Joseph Pulitzer. Uh, you know, because Joseph Pulitzer had been uh, a legislator and the, had been part of the Missouri legislature, uh, once he became you know this world famous publisher and made a recommendation that the University of Missouri create a journalism school, that actually happened, uh, and so uh, and they you know preceded us by a few years. Uh, when that um, what was I talking? About? Oh, what was I, oh the cost, right? Uh, when we look at that model. Like, we came into existence under the old regime of journalism. Like, how many jobs there were, how lucrative it was to publish, generally speaking, um, as opposed to what we see now. And so the, the succinct way of saying this is that the business model for journalism has changed, the business model for journalism education has not, generally. And that's where we see this disconnect, and that's why I'm, you know, part of my my uh, you know, top objective, you know, one of my top objectives is to raise enough money to offset the cost of our tuition. Well, what are these kids really good at when they arrive? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, there is a hurdle to jump to get into Columbia Journalism. Sure. So we have uh, an embarrassment of riches in, you know, in our application pool. Uh, that we have people, and that's one of the benefits of having the reputation we have uh, and having the history and the tradition that we have. Uh, we have applicants from all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of skill sets. Uh, you know, some people who were you know, standouts on their college paper, uh, some people who you know, didn't you know, have no journalism experience at all, but have ancillary career experience that you know helps them in you know tremendous ways uh, you know someone who was had worked in the NGO world uh, around refugee resettlement you know was one of our application pools uh, and had this in-depth nuanced layered knowledge of what was happening with refugee resettlement basically all around the world uh, and you know, just kind of going through, as I'm thinking about this because our application uh, cycle is just starting, that you just kind of reach down into the pile and almost always pull up you know, a set of, of applications uh, for really interesting, really sharp, really smart people. Uh, they're digital natives. They understand the internet in a way that we generally do not. Um, they have, and the other thing that I will say is useful is that I've seen in my time at the journalism school, uh, my first year, I, I started about three months before the 2016 election. Uh, and there was a shock wave on campus after the election because very many parents, particularly parents of Spanish speaking students, uh, Latino students, uh, parents of Muslim students, wanted their kids to come home. Um, because they thought that the kind of nativism in you know, American culture and American society at that point made this a dangerous place for their child. Uh, President Bollinger had to send out a letter, a uh, campus-wide letter, say, as many university presidents did, uh, saying that our campus uh, is a place where we uphold values of ex inclusivity, et cetera, et cetera. That resonated in the journalism school because we had an all-hands-on-deck meeting and uh, at that point, you know, Steve Cole said something and, and also uh, Bill Gruskin said something, echoed that point, that remained our guiding star. And they were like, for everything that happens now, reporting will be double or triple the importance that it normally has. Like, democracy depends upon reporting and good journalism. That happened the first year. Uh, then the pandemic happened. Then George Floyd happened. And so I see a pool of students, prospective students, who are really clear about the, the social function that journalism serves. How do you teach these kids to, 
to uh, detect and ignore or challenge misinformation or disinformation if there is, in fact, a difference between those two things? Sure. Uh, you know, that's another thing that was, uh, I think, a real central point. When I was mapping out, you know, what I would do if I became dean, and I was like, what would be the, the reason that, you know, this would be a, a good job to do? Uh, the misinformation and disinformation uh, element was really key, was really high on that. Uh, and so we have the Tau Center for Digital Journalism, uh, which is housed in the journalism school. They have been at the cutting edge front of analysis of how disinformation gets spread. Uh, one of the first places that was talking about how bot armies were being created and uh, you know, how they were uh, kind of circulating around in social media platforms and all of those things. So we're knee deep in the research um, that goes into that. On the other end of it, um, what I'm really interested in seeing become a, a more prominent part of our curriculum. This is a skill set that people you know, have if they're taking uh, data or if they're taking investigative. We want to see everyone uh, more acutely informed about things like digital forensics. You know, if someone is sending you a video and it purports to show uh, Russian soldiers committing war crimes uh, in Ukraine, how do you know that that video uh, is what it says it is? Um, how do you know that it is from January of 2023 and not from some uh, unrelated conflict uh, that happened two years ago? Uh, and so that is a growth area. One, you know, outlets are hiring um, in those areas. Uh, and two, the knowledge of how you walk through, uh, even if it's the, the basic Sherlock Holmes forensics of what, where is the sun in this video? Where are the shadows? What time of day does it purport to be? Uh, let's go on uh, the, to get an atlas uh, or the digital atlases of the globe and see where the sun would in, in fact be shining at that time of day um, on that date that it purports to be. Uh, are there serial numbers here? Like on these, uh, what kind of vehicle is that? What, when was that vehicle released? Is that, you know, was that vehicle, you know, if it's a later model than this, it says it is, and it means that these dates don't correspond. All of these really intricate ways that people use, and not even talking about the kind of more uh, technical ways that people are using coding and all that to kind of ascertain this. That is where journalism is, is going, you know, and the, the boundary between what we do and what, say, computer science, scientists do is much more permeable than it once was. Uh, we have to at least, if we're not fluent in that language as journalists, for the journalists who are graduating uh, out of our program each year, uh, if they're not fluent in the language, I'd like for them at least to be able to order in a restaurant using it. Um, <laughs> and, so, and so that's, that's where we are. Okay, before I make the transition to all the other subjects and or let the, everybody here ask questions, um, what does the news profession need to do to do better at diversity? It seems to me that the, the, the establishment, journal, journalism establishment has actually practically flunked out of school on, on this subject. Um, so there's a, whenever that comes up, I, there's a story that I tell, which is that um, I got my start at the Washington City Paper. Um, and it was, at the time, it was edited by David Carr, um, you know, who later, of course, became the legendary media reporter at the New York Times. Uh, Carr had this very, you know, straightforward Midwestern sensibility about things that if you knew him, um, you kind of come to appreciate. Uh, and so they'd come up, and the Washington City Paper at that time had all of this friction you know, between the staff, which was overwhelmingly white, and the city, uh, which especially at that time was overwhelmingly black. Uh, and so Carr was just kind of like, oh, we need more black people. Why don't we just look around? 
And so he created this internship program, which was meant to bring uh, you know, more writers of color into the publication. And his first two interns were me and ta Coates. I guess he couldn't pick them. Right. But to his credit, to his credit, I never saw David Carr brag about that. The only time I saw him ever reference that was to say, like his logic was, we're in a city, the city is full of African Americans, I'm sure somebody here is interested in writing or interested in at least considering becoming a journalist. Um, and he just started looking around. So he, he kind of shamed um, his peers. That was the only time he ever referenced that, saying, oh, it's so difficult to diversify. Well, how, how hard have you really tried? And so um, I think that some of this is a matter of actual effort. And the other is that, the other thing that people always say is that, oh, well, there's no pipeline. We have a pipeline issue. Um, if you don't have a pipeline, that means you have to create a pipeline. Uh, you know, one of the things I just became aware of is that less than 10% of the high schools in New York City have a school newspaper. And those wow. school newspapers are disproportionately clustered at institutions that are in well-off communities. Wow, that's a stunning. That's, so, that, that's something for actually the Silurians Press Club to take on. But there, I mean, this is, we have resources still, even in the kind of attenuated state of media now, we have the resources to say, like, how many people got started on their high school paper? There's your pipeline. Like, is there a paper in the community um, that is chronically underserved and underrepresented? Uh, and it's uh, either kind of looking into the pipeline to see who's there, like David Carr did, or helping to create a pipeline so people will find their way to you. Okay, um, to try to make the pivot here, please, since I'm sitting next to both, please tell me the difference between a, a, a or an historian and a journalist. <laughs> so it, it's interesting you say that because I had the kind of opposite kind of take on this because I was just at the American Historical Association. Wait, last... should I mention that he has a PhD in history? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Um, <laughs> so, so that line has always been very permeable to me. Uh, so I was a history and English effectively double major in undergrad. Um, and then when I finished at school, I went to work in local outlets in DC, worked at the Washington City paper, then went to graduate school and did a, a master's and PhD in American history. And so I've always kind of gone back and forth and I've given like, a lot of thought to that. Um, interestingly enough, there are a lot of crucial histories that have been written by journalists and some pretty significant journalism that's been written by historians. Um, and I think it's the kind of common theme of uh, doing the kind of forensic work to find out information that has been obscured or that is not visible to the public, uh, you know, digging into archives with which you know reporters uh, may need to do, historians frequently need to do, interviewing people, uh, kind of creating a cohesive narrative based upon what you know, uh, and engaging the public with it, which I, I think are the core skill sets that they have in common. Um, but you know, you know, William Shirer, you know, who wrote uh, *Rise and Fall of the Third Reich*. Uh, people assume that he's a historian, but he was a journalist. Um, Barbara Tuckman, you know, *The Guns of August*, uh, had a, a position that I found um, amusing when I learned of this, was that she was a journalist who earned a PhD in history. And I was like, oh, okay, you're there. You know, W. E. B. Du Bois was, of course, a journalist uh, who was publisher and editor of the the crisis for 20, more than 20 years. Uh, and so I think there's been a number of people, and my, just recently my colleague Howard French uh, wrote an amazing uh, history, Born in Blackness, uh, in which he grapples with uh, the implications of the slave trade and the nations that profited from it. Uh, and so, and it's gotten a really warm reception from historians. So I think that there is a kind of then overlap to some extent in those two fields. Wow, okay, so uh, 
My rule is only ask a one-part question and then listen to the answer, but I'm going to violate that because we have to uh, get the questions from the audience, so I'm going to roll up the whole rest of the subject into one big thing and ask you to do it like a three- or four-minute wrap. Oh, okay. Okay? They did not you, tell me that rapping was going to be involved in this conversation. Now, this is one of the many books that Jelani has written, The Substance of Hope. This was published in 2010. It happens to be about Barack Obama and what that meant to the country. And in it, he says, well, we can't yet judge what, how this is all going to play out. It's 13 years later, so I'd like to know what you think about that. But I also want to get into a couple of other subjects. I'll just name some names. Murdoch won. Donald Trump, in my view, enabled racism to resurface like an underground coal mine fire breaking out. And it was aided and abetted by the Koch brothers et al., who actually are, love Trump because they are trying to create mistrust in government, something we were talking about at the table, which I think is even more fundamental than racism, but pretty close fraternal twins, maybe. And then there, uh, you, you wrote a book about Dave Chappelle, and uh, there's a, lately we've had a, uh, an outburst or two about somebody you've written about, Kanye West. And then there's a, did the racism with Obama get accelerated by Mitch McConnell saying, I'm not going to do anything to help this guy the day he was uh, sworn in? Or did Trump accelerate that? And what's this Congress going to do, and what are we going to do about it in 2024? That's it. <laughs> if, 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 if I left anything out, please feel free to throw it in. <laughs> also, uh, can I fix the Knicks? Oh, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> One other thing. A subject you've written a lot about is sort of gun violence and, and, and problems with police. I didn't mean to leave that out. We're going to be here till April. <laughs> now, this man is succinct. <laughs> I, I really am not that succinct. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to try to touch upon, like, the big themes. Um, so, when, when Barack Obama um, was pressured to show his birth certificate, uh, to prove that he was, as I would say, to prove he was eligible to vote in the election that he actually won. Um, that was really a turning point, you know, because there had been this question about, you know, what would define that era. Uh, and a lot came from uh, Obama being elected. You know, quite frankly, for our industry, uh, I think a lot of publishers and editors looked around and realized that there were more black people living in the White House than there were working for their publication. Um, and it's kind of not a coincidence that so many of us date our emergence, even those of us who have been written, writing in, in small outlets, or mostly in black outlets, that all of us start cropping up around the same time. You know, Ta-Nehisi, me, uh, Jabel Bowie, Nicole Hannah-Jones, a whole array of voices. I'm leaving people out, uh, you know, uh, just Adam Serwer. Uh, a whole flowering of us came about in the wake of Obama. Uh, and I think that it was because of that kind of cultural implication of him being elected. At the same time, and this is where the historian's sensibility was useful to me, there has always been a backlash Every time there had been progress, um, there was a backlash to it. Um, and one of my friends who had an interesting vantage point on this, he had been the press secretary for Jesse Jackson's 1988 run and had been involved in politics and various uh, you know, outlets. Uh, around the time that Obama won the nomination, uh, he called me and he, he was like, oh, it looks like this guy is actually going to get it. And I said, yeah, and he said, you know there's going to be hell to pay. And I said, probably. And he said, and this was predictive and haunting, he said, you know the Voting Rights Act is dead. And I said, probably. And then 
2013, we saw the Voting Rights Act eviscerated. Uh, the fact that Donald Trump had been able to troll the President of the United States into proving he was actually a citizen, which had all of these implications, like the question, literally the defining question of black people in our historical experience in this country has been, are you a citizen? That Dred Scott decision in 1857 where he said that it was impossible for a Negro to be a citizen. Uh, and so it went all the way back. So everything that came from that, um, the tides of resentment, the feeling that if there was one black president that white people had lost something irreplaceable, that sentiment that Donald Trump represented. Uh, I grew up in Queens. Trump grew up in Queens. Different part of Queens, different time, but still Queens. Um, and I think it was always important to me to note that when I grew up in Queens, it was statistically the most diverse county in the United States. When Trump grew up in Queens, it was the second whitest borough of New York City after Staten Island. That flash changeover happened immediately after the 1965 immigration reform. And that's like the dividing line. Um, and you know, as for why it happened in Queens, the people here may, will likely remember Archie Bunker. Um, there was a reason that show was set in Queens. And he was the kind of archetypal working class, class white guy who was like, what is happening around me? Uh, and so I was joking with a friend of mine uh, who, whose family came from India to Queens. And you know, I was, we were talking about the 65 Immigration Act and he said, she said, uh, my parents traveled thousands of miles to get to America and then decided to move any more than 10 miles away from the airport. <laughs> so they landed and were like, hey, this is it, good. <laughs> I don't need to see the rest of the country. Um, but sure, that happened with Indians, that happened with Jamaicans, that happened with Pakistanis, that happened um, you know, with Chinese, that happened with Koreans, you know, in all of those communities that came to represent the changing face of the nation, metaphorically, that is what Trump was reacting to, is what he has been reacting to his whole life. Um, and that tier of white Queens residents who fled um, you know, in the face of this diversification of the borough was metaphorically, that was the language he was steeped in. And so it just mapped onto these trends that by the time 2016 happened, where the whole country was worried about the things that Archie Bunker had been worried about in 1970, it wasn't a shock that someone like him could win the presidency. And we factor in the cratering, um, the cratering regard for media um, this kind of a la carte idea of reality where you can accept the parts of reality that you like and reject the parts that you don't agree with. Uh, and we had a prescription for the democratic crisis that we're in, um, which I think is kind of low grade fever. Like, I think we kind of exhaled after 2020 and, well, oh, okay, you know. Um, and also, by the way, I always say that this is like, I'm not worried about making these comments in appearing to sound partisan, I had the exact same critique of Donald Trump when he was a Democrat. Um, and so it wasn't the partisanship, um, it was the underlying philosophy of it, I think, that was really the most significant. Okay, this is my last question then. So given the, the current Supreme Court, which way is racism going in this country? Oh, I mean, I, th I don't think that those two things are um, contingent on each other, but I think that what has happened um, is that what I think what will happen is that affirmative action will be killed. Um, and you know, I have a much longer kind of analysis of it. Uh, but one of the reasons that we, we don't really think about why affirmative action came into existence. And one of the reasons for it was that, you know, Richard Nixon, which was actually the, the biggest proponent of affirmative action, even though policies that kind of were they weren't called affirmative action, but you know kind of fit into what affirmative action would ultimately be, had begun under Lyndon B. Johnson, but it was really really Nixon's baby. Um, and that was because Nixon was smart. He was a lot of things, but he wasn't stupid. Um, and he was looking at American cities and seeing people set stuff on fire um, and saying that in a different world, Stokely Carmichael would have been a blue chip attorney. Like what sent that dude down the path of wanting to burn the whole system down? Um, you send that person to Yale Law School, 
uh, and then to Wall Street, or then to Madison Avenue, or then to wherever, and they find a secure niche in American society, and your cities are not on fire. And Nixon understood that. And so I think that to the extent that you lock people into a endless, hopeless cycle, people of different racial backgrounds, into an endless, hopeless cycle of economic turmoil and despair, you wind up making your society less safe. And so I worry that the kinds of things that are being taken away now are only breeding future um, circumstances where American cities are on fire again. Where's our, uh, there he is, the, our, the Silurian's answer to Frank Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Sinatra has a cold, by the way. <laughs> I, I think that means if I say something bad about you, I'll wind up with my legs broken. <laughs> um, it's 10 to 2, and uh, as, as uh, Alan said at the top, Jelani has, a, has to leave. He has another appointment, so we have 10 minutes. We, Let's we get some 15, questions in here. Keep those questions succinct. How would you use the George Santos story as a teachable moment in journalism? Yeah, um, you know, we're going to do something like, unfortunately, that, that kind of like cropped up in the middle of the break. Um, and so we're going to do something in conjunction with CJR, which we haven't even talked about, um, but Columbia Journalism Review. Uh, and it's obvious the kind of uh, local journalism implications of that. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, and the fact that that happened in the backyard of the, the biggest media center in the country, really in the world, is a testament to what is happening in smaller markets everywhere. Um, and so the Santos story, I think, is really crucial. Uh, but I was telling uh, my wife today that, you know, you know, I don't know if you saw the latest thing, that he allegedly uh, crowdfunded money to get, uh, to get service animals for vets. Um, and I was like, oh no, that's gonna do him in. I told my, my wife, who's like, you can get away with a lot of things in America, but not mistreating dogs. Like, <laughs> you know, like Good, goodbye, Mr. Santos. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Leslie Wayne. I'm on your adjunct faculty. I understand that enrollment this uh, semester is down. Yeah. And I'm just interested in why enrollment is down. And also, when you put together a class, how it breaks down between international and US students. And then the other, sorry, Alan. The, the other part is how much of the, the, the high cost is a barrier to putting together a, a class that represents economic you know, diversity, you know, diversity of all kinds? Yeah. Uh, OK, so I got your second and third. What was your first question again? Why is the enrollment down? Oh, why is enrollment down? So, um, Thank you for asking that, you know, and the first part of it is we don't really know. Um, part, of, part of the reason that it's down is that, first off, this is not particular to us. Uh, it's down at Northwestern, it's down at Berkeley, it's down at like the schools that are within our, um, in the same applicant pool, you know, people who apply to us apply to these places. It's down across the board. Uh, interestingly enough, last year we were crammed, you know, packed to the rafters uh, because it was the, the COVID cycle. People who held off then all applied that one year. Uh, and so we may have just kind of depleted our market and wound up with a smaller haul for the year after that. Um, it may be a bigger thing, the after effects of the pandemic and the economic precariousness have made people less uh, inclined to take on, you know, the potential debt of, excuse me, of graduate school. Um, interestingly enough, enrollment is up at undergraduate programs. So we're really trying to suss out, you know, what that is and trying to see like what our application pool looks like this year to try to figure out what the takeaways are. Uh, we don't want to be passive about it, so we're um, in the midst of uh, coming up with marketing, promotion things. We're doing more in-person stuff, uh, you know, bringing people on campus. Uh, after we have admitted, uh, I made a commitment to call all of the students who have been admitted. <laughs> so 
to invite them to, to come to journalism school, come to Columbia Journalism School. So it's going to be like my personal telethon. Um, but that actually makes a difference. Uh, and so there are those things. In terms of the, the breakdown between um, international and, um, and domestic, that fluctuates too. So one of the things that's happened is that the, the decrease has been almost entirely driven by domestic applications. Uh, our applications from abroad, strong, um, as always. Uh, our four biggest uh, applicant uh, locales are China, India, uh, Canada, and the UK. Uh, and so there's no uh, distinction there. So whatever dynamic we're looking at is mostly driven by the US. Uh, and so, you know, that determines, some of it is, you know, what we're emphasizing in any given year, um, how strong the applications are from, you know, particular places at particular times. You know, some of it is just kind of like, you know, the stock market, like you can't predict what all the dynamics are. Um, you know, you can kind of reverse engineer some of it after the fact. Uh, but we are generally about 40% international. And we try to stay in that range um, because that is, you know, a good mix of you know serving the different communities that are invested in what Com Columbia Journalism School is. And your last question: How much of the, the, the high cost is barrier putting together a, a broad class? So I don't have a number for that. What I have is a strong suspicion for that. Um, and we've been trying to. Um, what we did last semester really was trying to um, quantify you know, what the impact of that is, like how specifically it is. Uh, what I do know in the big picture is that it's not sustainable in the long run. Um, and we didn't talk about this very much, but uh, what we are working on, um, you know, this is on the record, so I don't know if I should even tell you all this, but. Um, we're working on measures that will allow people to pay off their loans after, um, possibly pegging that to uh, you know, working in nonprofit news or working in local news. Uh, and so we can create a program where for every student that goes into local news or nonprofit news and stays there for five years, over the course of those five years, we will pay off your loans. That would greatly alleviate that problem All while right. also effectively subsidizing nonprofit and local news. So, Dean. So, how would I do that with international? Um, so, you know, the international is a slightly more complicated picture, um, but part, it's, it's also dividing between the number of our international students who wind up staying here and reporting in the United States. Um, but there are mechanisms to actually determine like what we would do with outlets abroad. And we're still in the intellectual formation stage of this. We're still defining what local news is, which is not as easy as it seems. We say local news, but if I say local news, for however many people are in this room, that's however many definitions we have of local news. Um, and so that's going to require a lot of work, a lot of math. Um, and a lot of kind of digging into, you know, finding what we didn't do. We knew that our, like the percentage of our graduates that were hired, you know, which is around 70%, uh, if they graduate in May, about 70% of our graduates are typically employed by September. What we hadn't done was the fine details about what type of outlets, how many of them in nonprofit, how many of them in local, how many of them in uh, major metropolitan areas, uh, how many of them go abroad? How many of them, like, and th that kind of really um, granular detail in order to be able to figure out where we make the biggest impact. Um, but, you know, for me, uh, you mentioned it, well, actually, Eileen mentioned it when she read my bio. Um, the defining experience for me as a young person was the fact that it took me seven years to finish undergrad. Um, I went to school when I had money. When I didn't have money, I didn't go to school. Um, and if I do anything as a dean that's worthwhile, it will be in diminishing the degree to which finances determine somebody's ability to pursue their dreams. Uh, dean, I have my uh, undergraduate degree in journalism from the Medill School at Northwestern. When I graduated, it was the Medill School of Journalism. Mm -hmm. 
now as close as I can see it. It's the Medill School of Journalism, Marketing, and a bunch of other stuff. Sure. Do they belong in the same breath? Do they belong together? Um, for us, no. Um, but for Medill, maybe. No. You know, no, no, I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna say this. Um, because I don't, I don't, I've never thought that there was one way to do, to do what we do. Um, and I also think that quite frankly, if I'm just being, if I'm looking at this from the perspective of a dean, the fact that you have students studying public relations winds up subsidizing the fact that you have comparatively smaller numbers of students studying journalism. If you're talking about tuition dollars, um, and it's the same thing like with, like, like, when I, when I looked at the New York City, I wrote a, a piece about the school closures um, for the New Yorker uh, and the small school movement, which is now kind of petered out. Uh, but when everyone was like, we need to create small schools, we need to create small schools. Um, and then what I found was that there were these economies of scale that even if the people like, you shouldn't put a, have a school where there's a ton of poor kids all together. And it was like, okay, that makes sense. But then what they found was that when they had larger schools, they could actually do things they couldn't have done if it was a small school that still had a bunch of poor kids in it. Um, and so part of that is just scale. How many students are enrolled in this structure? Um, how much revenue comes in? How much you're paying in salary? Um, how much you're paying in infrastructure? And if you spread that cost out across a whole array of things, there's the argument for purism but there's also the argument that the journalism, the journalism students benefit in a bigger sense. Okay, uh, the dean had said he needed to leave at two, but he said he'd go to 2.05. Yeah. We've got three minutes left. We're going to radio Speed mode. Round. 10 okay. second questions, okay. 20 second answers. Okay. So they got a swarm of people over here. I, I want to know about TikTok and the other intellectual things that are being talked about now. Uh, What's happening with Columbia to, to keep them from taking over? To keep, uh, to keep what from taking over? TikToks. The artificial intelligence, the rewriting of documents. You know, how are we keeping that out of the hands of journalists? Yeah, yeah um, I think that's a, a bigger question that I can answer in 20 seconds, but I, I think uh, the short answer is that we are um, in the midst of the Tau Center, which I mentioned before. Um, we're in the midst of pursuing grants and uh, funding that will allow it to, to drastically increase the work that it's doing around those very specific issues. But are you going to ban TikTok? No, TikTok? no, we're not banning TikTok. Um, well, there's no plan right now to ban TikTok. I mean, I left Twitter and made a very clear distinction between me leaving and Columbia Journalism School leaving. Columbia Journalism School is still active on Twitter. Um, and so there's not a plan to leave right now. Hi, this is probably an old people question, but a couple of years ago I went to my reunion at the journalism school and I went to all the symposiums and panels and everything else, and there was one word I did not hear, and that was newspaper. Mm -hmm. And is that any part of the J school at all anymore? Um, and in what sense? You mean, do, are students learning, are they working at newspapers? Yeah, are you teaching about newspapers? Is it part of the curriculum, or has it just it, I mean, newspapers come up in our history of journalism class. <laughs> yeah, at this point, people will start throwing tomatoes at me. Um, but uh, no, I mean, we, we have some interaction and some connection, um, you know, with print. Uh, but, you know, as you saw, like every week, a new print outlet is going all digital. I mean, the, the kind of last, most recent, uh, you know, big tree to fall in the forest was the, the AJC um, going all digital. Uh, the Washington City paper where I started went all digital, uh, I think about five or six months ago. Uh, and so the future of our, of our students, the, the places where they are likely to find uh, employment uh, is going to be in digital outlets. Uh, and so that's where most of our focus has been. One more. Thanks. Oh, you're going to do it? Okay. Hi. Love in the Shoes. Um, 
the aggregator Axios this morning had a, an attempt to measure the impact of or the intrusion of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. into various industries, essentially saying 100% in Wall Street and a beginning intrusion in medicine. I wonder if you'd take that on for journalism. So it's funny you would say that because that is, um, th that's a double-edged sword, um, which is one, if we were talking about chat GPT um, and, you know, in the classrooms, on the education side of it, you want to make sure that a student doesn't just plug in a few keywords and spit out an article about, you know, uh, something happening at the Bronx Zoo that they've been, you know, assigned to cover. Um, and so, part of that is offset by the fact that you have to actually go out and quote people, go out and find people and talk to them. So, you know, that is, maybe it makes it a little bit different for us, uh, but it's still a, a, an uncomfortable area. So we, in our faculty retreat yesterday, just yesterday, um, we're talking about how you structure assignments to make them not hackable in that way. Um, you know, whether it is that people have to do their stories, uh, a draft of their story in the class, you know, whether they're doing something on something that's not connected to the internet, like whatever that is, um, that's part of it. The other side of it is that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity where if you are, um, you know, trying to pull together, you know, facts or information about, uh, you know, a subject that you have to write on, especially for general assignment work where the nature of it is that you get thrown at, into situations where you're not an expert. In that case, artificial uh, intelligence makes it really easy for you to kind of gather all the relevant knowledge. But in the end, I think it goes back to the question that you raised, and it's the question that comes up with every iteration of technology is how do we use this ethically? Um, and how do we forestall the ability for misuse of it? And I think it's just the same sort of question that comes up again and again. And we're at the very front of that conversation. Thank you Thank very you. much, Dean Cobb. That was just terrific.